Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, September 30th, 2021, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast this week. You know, we almost had it. We almost broke our streak of duo casts. We I know. had Kishore and Jeremy lined up, ready to podcast this morning. Uh, and then a last minute meeting, because you guys have real jobs, full-time jobs, uh, meant that uh, Kishore had fortunately to bail. So we're once again bouncing back and forth. Jeremy, if you have in, something to relay to Kishore next week, let me know. And this game of telephone can uh, can continue. I want to know if he's in line for the Amazon robot. That's all I want to know. <laughs> I was so excited for him to be on the show this week to to to, to talk uh, to share his opinions. Let's say about the Amazon robot. Although yeah. we, we will have opinions as well. Uh, good to see you, Jeremy. How are things been going this past week? Uh, no past complaints. two weeks. Yeah, no complaints. No complaints. Uh, it's all fine. It's all good. Um, yeah, it's all good. You know what? You're a game developer, and as a game developer, uh, I would think that you would have some complaints uh, if you had seen the movie Free Guy, and that's where I want to jump in. We have only one bit of pop culture this week. You know, I, I don't want to talk about uh, the, 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 the like reviews for Venom and Bond have been out, but no, well, no wait a there's minute. a lot of text to. That can't be right because th- then you must have not seen last night's episode of What If. I did not see last night's uh-huh. episode of What If. Uh-huh. I, I'm this, two episodes behind. This is the episode that IGN is saying, wait a minute, did What If just become required viewing for all MCU fans? Yeah, so you got to go watch this thing, man. Okay. You got to catch up, and we'll talk about it next week. We'll or you talk and about it next can. week. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's good incentive to do that. But uh, Free Guy, the Ryan Reynolds, Sean Levy... Jodie Comer, Disney, Fox movie, the movie that was made two years ago. Uh, you know, it, it, it sounds like it, on the paper, it, something that would have appealed to us, yeah, a, a comedy, action comedy about what if, what if an NPC in an MMO uh, became self-aware. Love it. Right. And uh, it's out on streaming, which is why I'm talking about it now. Many people, many of you may have seen it in theaters. I don't want to go into spoilers, but I will say one thing, Jeremy. I'm really curious, whenever you get a chance to watch it, what your thoughts are about its portrayal of game development and game developers. Because I I think it's fair to say when you watch a, a fun movie like this, the suspension of disbelief allows you to take – allows the – the filmmakers that take a lot of creative liberties about video games. You know, it's a movie ostensibly about set in a video game world, has lots of allusions and call outs to, you know, archetypes and and tropes in MMOs, in games like Grand Theft Auto, like and 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 uh, shared multiplayer worlds, metaverse type games. And the visualizations, sure. I I I accept the fact that the fantastical graphics or whatever they show uh, on screen is a it goes through the filter of something to make it believable for for the mainstream audience who may not understand that a video game it may not be actually that exciting or you know the animations aren't that complex or right. or whatnot the casuals exactly like, I I accept that there's an extra sheen extra la- layer of polish for some of that stuff for the the stuff that's portrayed in game the thing that I thought we were done with and we were past with is oh. the portrayal of developers and wait it, it, i didn't even realize developers were a part of this movie well it's not a huge spoiler to say that you know part of the game part of the movie is set in in this game world but like maybe a, a grid analogy is the lego movie oh yes uh, part of part of this movie is also set in the real world you got to have that that um uh, the, the, you know the what's the meta. actually happening. The meta, right? The, right, the meta story of the actual reality. Uh, you know, in in the fiction of the movie, the very popular game, uh, which I don't even remember the name of at this point. It, it, it's uh, made by a company called Tsunami, spelled S O O N A M I, Tsunami. Whatever. Uh, but <laughs> I would have thought that. The portrayal of game developers as like obnoxious game bros or having these sleek, you know, polished, 
thirty floor skyscraper apart, or you know, uh, uh, workspaces with these multi monitors, like these beautiful glass desks, like that. I thought we were done with that. The the whole like hacker like slapping a keyboard to 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 type some code, like like that's that's not what real game development is. It, and it's not about that's the glamour of it, but there's a whole tone of game development. And like there's one guy at QA, you know, like that they portray one guy, single person who does QA for the most popular MMO in the world. Like <laughs> these are the things that I am not willing to forgive. Right. Like, I that, hear that, you. That. Yeah. You want authenticity in there. You want that that the grit of reality that so we can actually educate the people while we entertain them. Is that what you're saying? I don't even need it to be fully authentic. Like I just want it to be believable. I think that as a even as a mainstream society, enough people play video games that and enough people read reviews or have an awareness. Like, you know, video game development is a thing that kids today and parents today are aware of because it's a realistic career. It no longer is this like magical thing, you know, in the way that it was maybe portrayed in like even like Ready Player One or certainly, you know, in the 90s, right? Like the the whole single game developer makes makes a whole game. Like enough people, I think, even at a young age, from things like Roblox and 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 Minecraft and all, like kids understand what it means to maybe work in games and the portrayal in this movie just was completely a caricature that's amazing that's that's really ironic given that my boss and your friend mike micah consulted on this movie and is in the credits <laughs> and <laughs> i did not know that and is is actually quite proud of this film so i i i can't wait to to balance your perceptions with his perceptions and watch this movie now that it's out on streaming i've been i've been waiting because i wanted he he saw it of course when it came out in the theater and so he's been talking about it for a month or two but now that it's out on streaming i can finally watch it and i can't wait this is this is great great feedback yeah i i, I can see the things that maybe he insults I, I i can pinpoint the things that maybe he was proud of like portrayal of crunch or you know uh, I don't want to give away too many gags, but like uh, assets that aren't completed, right? In a game, like yeah. the, the fact that games don't magically appear, that there are like teams of people working on this, but there is a whole like for a movie where they're trying to have this dichotomy of the the, the sheen of a in game world versus what's in the reality. Both those feel like caricatures, and that took me out of it. There wasn't enough contrast in that. Um, but overall, you know, it's it, for me. I would sell it as like it's a Lego movie and a, a PG, kid-friendly episode of Black Mirror. Not as dark as Black Mirror, but definitely the same, similar undertones. Right. I mean, yeah, Ryan Reynolds is is good. Like, he he, he seems to be able to turn any role into an, a nice piece of entertainment. He's got a good personality. So I, I would just go to, to see him and, uh, you know, stay for the rest. It looks It looks <laughs> like it's got good special effects, but I can't wait to see it. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think about. It. We maybe talk about it in the future if Kishore has seen it as well. I know it's a movie that's been out for a couple months now, but just now out on streaming. Okay, yeah. wait, where is it on streaming? By the way, uh, it's it, uh, video on demand, so not Disney Plus. Got it. It's one of those like, iTunes or yeah, you can you can just buy it to to rent to stream, rent 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 to stream, uh, or buy pre order the DVD Blu Ray. Um, before we get into the news, though, uh, I did want to share with you a. A new thing I discovered, and this is a little bit of a behind the scenes of a project I'm working on. Um, if you watch some of our recent tested videos, you know I've been experimenting with uh, LED strips, different kinds. Like uh, most recently, one of my favorites are those COB chip on board LED strips, the one that look very continuous, uh, but they have that look where it's it's a, a solid color diffuse, and then it's extra bit of like the 3M tape and the PCB goes a little bit wider. So, um, you still see like, you know, that three, four millimeter wide piece of board, but now it's a continuous strip of light. So is you this the one that COB. you, the one you made your norm, uh, no, no, no. Those, those were, those are standard LED strips configured in a way to balance light sideways into a silicone tube. Right. Right. So those are th fake neon lights. That again is a clever way to get a, a nice continuous diffuse effect, but it's and also to allow you to curve the LED strips because it's 
oriented sideways. So it's pretty bulky. Uh, the COB ones are the ones I did my like TDK sign out of. Oh, yeah. So it still looks continuous, but they're flat. And so you have to do the LED strip origami. You can't do hard turns. Right. Um, but they they look continuous because it's densely packed and it has a little bit of a diffuse strip. But it's still like a wide piece of, you know, taped PCB board, right? It's still like like the it's, it's like tape, like a, a piece of um like tape measure or something, right? Right. Um and then a lot of people are familiar with like EL wire, uh, electroluminescent wire, but this is something that's like a hybrid in between. If you're watching the video, what I'm holding up, this is about a 10 inch strand of LED filament. And it's a silicone tube that is very bendable. Um, have you seen those? I mean, uh, for people who aren't watching, it looks like you're holding a shoelace. Yeah. Th- this is hey, com- it's like a it's like a rubbery, it's like a piece of spaghetti. Yeah, right? exactly. And I, I can, and I can loop it around. I can coil it really tightly. I can even bend it to a point where it's like I'm like squeezing it, almost like I'm, 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 I feel like I'm going to break it. Yeah, like it looks like it. you would. Yeah, but it's still holding in place. And you can bend it in any direction. Any direction. So That's I can crazy. Twist. I can. It, it basically is a little piece of, you know, like, like you said, a shoelace or a, a right. firm piece of spaghetti. And then what's um, on the, the ends? So two contact points in the end. Uh, there's a little indent for positive and negative. So unlike a traditional LED strip, I cannot cut this and right. have it still working. Uh, the way the the circuits work, it has to be this length, and they do sell at different lengths. But you may be familiar with this in a shorter length. Have you seen those like fake Edison bulbs? Sure. They're LED, right? Yeah. Those fake Edison bulbs use versions of this at right. like two or three inches, and they just have like four of them in an arrangement, but that's essentially what those are. If you, if you like Google LED Edison bulb, uh, it's like strands of this, but those are typically like a warm white and like 2200 K and very short length. And people have been buying those and harvesting these strips. You know, you can break them apart, desolder them Hmm. and get these and you can create, you know, like, um, lightsaber effects or blaster effects in your dioramas, but they sell these, uh, at longer lengths. So this is, 30 millimeters, but uh, it's a little shorter, I think, than 30 millimeters. Basically, they call this 30 millimeters. They have one that's four times as long wow. at uh, 1,200 millimeters. But I like this one because this is three volts. So it can run off two AA batteries. And, yeah. and you're saying the longer one is is more? Uh, the longer one is 24 volts. Huh. Yeah, okay. so I, I don't know. And and I, I think that some of the the first generation ones, the shorter ones, were 24 volts. So I, I think it's all about, you know, what they can pack in the resistance in here to get it to to work off of three volts. Hmm. Um, I do have I have a small battery pack. I said to pull that out. Oh, I, this is one of those cases where having I don't know how you deal with this, but I just use alligator clips for for all my like quick, quick and dirty, get get things uh, connected. Um, sure, super handy. But let me see if I can. Are you about to light up your LED up. strip for us? Yeah, I'm gonna wow. see if I can light it up really quickly, and uh, I'll need you to help. Describe for the yeah, audience. Yeah, describe, <laughs> describe, paint the word picture as I. Norman is connecting <laughs> the, the yellow terminal to one of the tiny terminals on the LED strip, and then on the other end, he's connecting a color. That remains to be seen. Black. The ground. Ground should always be black, right? <laughs> so you get right. one, you, it's one terminal on either end? One terminal on either end. You, I was trying to see if I could connect them in the series. Well, that makes it really easy, doesn't it? Yeah, like, I mean, like, to, to, to wire and power, yeah, absolutely. That's cool. So there aren't two terminals on one end that you could power the whole thing from. You have to run it. You to have to run it, yeah, on both ends. Um, Still, that does and, sound like an easier proposition. So here it goes. Okay. And wow, there nice. It goes. Yeah. So you so got like I've, a, I've lit it up. Yep. Like a UV color, some sort of and blue. This is the, well, this is a blue. I, I think on the camera, yeah. it's just overexposed right now. But look at how flexible that is. That if you're is watching the video. And totally even, as you would expect, since there's LEDs throughout. It's it's densely packed. Where I can see them and where it doesn't show up in the video is the LEDs are maybe, um, they're evenly spaced. So the LEDs are maybe a millimeter wide with maybe a half a millimeter between them. And so I, I, I can't count how many are in here, but you know 
easily a hundred. Half a millimeter between them. I mean, that's nothing. Yeah, that's amazing. It's nothing. Wow. Yeah. But you can still see the spacing, you know, up close. Uh, but to your eyes and to oh, the yeah. exposure of the camera, it looks continuous. It just looks like this glowing blue wire. That's super cool, man. Yeah. Um, and like I said, they they the, the only limitation is that they you are fixed at this length. You can't trim them to any size, I, I believe, because of the way they're wired. There's like one controller that like they kind of feed back um and, and have their own completed circuit. I'll bet if you were if you wanted it bad enough and yes, you had the yes. tools. Yes. Yeah. All right. And then the skills beyond my capabilities. Right. Uh but you know, uh, I, I got I picked up something you recommended, which was a USB power supply. And so this is something that can output, can take the five volts out of any USB battery or a laptop and can output like up to, you know, down to three volts, down to 1.5 volts or up to 30 volts. Yeah. Uh, and I've been using that so I can, um, I can string up multiple of these together because I, I want three strands together on the nine volts. Yeah. You're going to want a lot of current from that battery because it trades the amps for the, for the volts. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, it'll get a little dimmer, but uh, I can also up 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 the up the current here with the the second dial. I'll include a link to this thing. This thing's really handy. Thank you for recommending it, Jeremy. Yeah, those are, it's, it's basically like a tiny USB powered benchtop power supply. You know, yeah, like right. like I have this big honking thing where I can dial in whatever voltage and amps I want for a project that I'm working on, and right. that is exactly what that does on a smaller scale. Very convenient. And the input is USB, whether it's plugged directly in USB A or USB C port, yeah. and so you can have it, you know, connected to like a USB wall outlet or something, Handy. and then you get exactly, exactly whatever power you need. Uh, so that's a just a little bit of a preview on something. I thought you'd find that interesting uh, as someone who's dabbled in this type of electronics. Absolutely, like the one thing, like the <clears throat> LEDs behind you that that look like uh, neon lights, those right. do come in RGB. Uh, but oh, okay, right. It, but what well, you just showed me, like, can't it? It, it there's correct. Like, yeah. I can't imagine unless they add more terminals and like the controllers become enormously small. It's possible, um, but uh, you know, it doesn't sound like that would come at least in that form factor uh, with no. a single terminal on either end. Yeah, and and you'd also lose the density, right? If it was RGB, they'd have to have a cluster of RGB or RGB next to each other as opposed to RGB in some type of circular arrangement that you get on, on some LED strips. Right. So at this diameter of right. that strand, like it's going to be really difficult to pack in. But they sell it in red, green, blue, uh, cold white, and warm white. So Super enough cool. for uh, multiple types of projects. Great show and tell, Norm. Yeah. Um, all right. Now let's get into some gear. Um, iPhones and iPads came out last week. You didn't pick up an iPhone. I did pick up an iPhone last mm -hmm. week. Kishore and I talked about some of the reviews and some of our um, some of our some of the surprises and things that we had learned from those reviews. But now, having had an actual time mm -hmm. about a week with a new phone on this end and the new iPad on your end, uh, I wanted to pick your brain about the iPad and let you ask questions about the iPhone. Look, um, so yeah. The, Where do you want to start? Not much to tell about the iPad. It's what you'd expect. It's a faster iPad. It's you know got the. I'm getting used to the Touch ID on the power button. Um, it, basically, I got it for just I, pure practical. You know, I read the iPad in bed at night every t every night, and I go to bed and I pick it up. And the six year old one was just molasses. I mean, it was just it. You waited to pull up a website, and sometimes like it would crash, and it's just too much you know, at the end of the day for me to, to like have that kind of patience. And so I wanted a new one. I got the new one. It's fast. It does what I want. Um, I have no complaints. I don't even know what the camera looks like. I, it's not, like <laughs> I don't take pictures with, with the iPad. I'm sure it's great. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'll hopefully I'll be happy with, for with another six years. Um, so, but have but, you, go ahead. Well, have you seen the reports on the iPad of the LCD screen behavior? That's peculiar. Yeah. What do they call it? Warble, wobble, uh, screen wiggle, jelly scroll. That's it. <laughs> um, I, I, that, that, that is really getting into the weeds. I feel like there's people who it's almost like, <clears throat> um, rainbows in, um, in, uh, in, in what, what was that projector technology that, that DLP? It, yeah, DLP projectors. What, like some people see the eyes. rainbows, yeah. some people don't see the rainbows. I think this is even lower <laughs> level, like fewer people are going to ever notice this, like this. Like I certainly don't notice this, and apparently it it does depend on what direction, what orientation you're holding the iPad in, 
It's like there's a controller bar in there that feeds the information to the pixels, and the information gets to the pixels at different rates, so that if your controller bar is on one side of your screen and you scroll, in slow motion video, you can detect that one side of the screen is going faster than the other. Um, I, and it, it's probably... Um, I don't know if, if a ProMotion display would would show this worse or not, but this is just a 60 hertz display. I haven't noticed it yet, um, and, I, and I really don't think this is a big deal. Do you? So I haven't seen it in person, so I, I can't tell. And I, I do feel like this is one of those things that you're right, it's in the weeds, but it might be one of those things that as people, once they notice it, it's hard to not notice, which I could was... Imagine which was the same thing with that DLP rainbow effect. I saw the rainbows and I couldn't, I couldn't stop seeing the rainbows. Right. right. Uh, it apparently only happens in portrait orientation. And one way to describe the effect, if you haven't seen a video is that it's a rolling shutter for the display. So camera, you know, uh, cameras capture information with the sensor linearly, you know, line by line. And when there's fast moving, action in front of a camera and you have a shutter that's not a global shutter but a rolling shutter what the, the the latency between what it captures at the top of the sensor and the bottom of the sensor is different enough so that what you see in the resulting captured image or video is a jelly like scrolling effect it's why like trying to film the propellers of an airplane is difficult yeah for cameras with rolling shutters and this seems to be the equivalent of that for a display where if you're scrolling even text really quickly in portrait orientation, what's updated from the right side of the screen versus the left side of the screen is done unevenly. And you're right, I think at a higher refresh rate, because this is not 120 hertz, this is standard 60 hertz, I think at a higher refresh rate, it would be less noticeable because overall you're refreshing the screen faster. Yeah. I think you're right. Because uh, I now that I think about it, I, um, did I fix it do it? A video on this. Somebody did a video about this, and and they did do the comparison with an iPad Pro that that is at 120, and it it also exhibited it, but it was almost impossible to see. Like even in slow motion video, they could like break it down and like show you with that it was there, but it was. You're right. It was less noticeable for sure. I I really think this is something that your general consumer would never have even known about, and now that they've been told about it, probably can't even tell. Won't, won't even be able to honestly like this is this is like people have found something and this is just you know people love to complain about things i don't think this is a big deal i really don't if i'm wrong tell me in the comments i'd love to know if, if you actually have a problem with this if it bothers you well apple has come out after the complaints and in a very like it, it's almost it reminds me of the old steve jobs days remember with the the iphone 4 and the antenna issue that people block the antenna with their pinky and the reception You're went it away. Yeah. You're holding it wrong. And Steve Grapp so begrudgingly had to, you know, offer free bumpers for yeah. everyone, right? Like they have come out and say, this is normal behavior. This is how LCD means are supposed to operate, how their controller boards were supposed to operate. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not a bug in the hardware or the software, meaning they're not going to fix it. You know, right. Wait. Wait till we update to ProMotion to 120 hertz for the minis in the future. We're selling you a $500 tablet. You know, be happy with your $500 A15 powered tablet. Right. So, what do you think of the phone, Norm? Is it a is it a upgrade? You only went. You only you upgraded last year already. So you I'm on only the went. Plan. You only went one generation. Yeah. Where are you seeing the benefits? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think I agree with the reviews in that the two primary benefits are battery life and camera where battery life and camera are the things that you're going to appreciate the most from a day to day i'm up there on the upgrade plan so for me it's kind of like i'm getting the best value for setting my last year's phone in i like having the new stuff i've, I've come to terms with the fact that i'm paying like 55 bucks a month for to lease this phone right that's how i think of it. it's like a car lease yeah i get I more than 55 dollars a month worth of value from this phone. I don't blame you. I mean, we we sp used to spend an enormous amount like upgrading computers frequently. Don't do that so much anymore. The computer we use most often is in our pocket. And so I don't I don't blame you. We're we're you know, tech obsessed and you're on tested.com, you need to have the latest phone. But so I I want to know specifically about that camera. Like yeah. what what is it? Um, like, do you do you like the what is it? What is the cinematography mode? What Cinematic mode. Yeah, Cinematic yeah. So mode. That's the computational photography version uh, feature that takes advantage of the processing, right? So they have this new chip, and I think we've kind of discussed, you know, we've there's diminishing returns on the on the power, the computational power required for basic functions. 
from watching video to web browsing to even taking photos and video, the A14 chip was fine. A13 chip was fine. People on iPhone 11s are having totally good time. So, yeah. but Apple's going to continually develop their chip because they need at scale to have something powerful enough for whenever they're going to have their VR AR headset out. That's going to need an incredible amount of processing power on the uh, on the, uh, the the visual side, display side, as well as uh, good battery life. And as they move to five nanometer process, A15s on battery life becomes a huge improvement naturally. So I've noticed battery life. It's just not like, ooh, fresh battery, my phone lasts longer. It actually feels like from what's been measured on the phone, I get more, I, I'm at 80% later in the day, right? Okay. The phone, I'm like, ooh, I'm, at, I'm never getting to 40% on a single day's use on my phone by end of day, which feels great. Um, it's another reason to be on the upgrade plan because batteries are consumables and I'm getting a fresh battery every year. I know it's not the greatest for the environment. I just got the hope that Apple does recycling properly. The camera by itself, the wider aperture, so the bigger cameras, the cameras are, themselves are bigger, right? Like the actual lenses, that mm -hmm. bump on the bottom is pretty pronounced at this point, but that's an acceptable thing. Like they're selling these as cameras with computers attached to them. And I like the new ultra wide a lot. The fact that you can do autofocus, the previous ultra wide, I like the field of view a lot, great for video, but it was just noisy for photos. The new ultra wide actually is, is more usable, um, for video. Have you tried some macro photography? I'm impressed with the macro photography. Honestly, it works, but you know what? The, uh, the moment you get super close to an object, you're blocking the light with the phone. Mm. And so you're getting like the phone shadow cast in the object unless you're orienting it to the subject at a perpendicular angle. So you're limited with its macro use. All it means is that uh, finally they have had autofocus and shifting focus on the ultra wide. Sure, great. Ultra wide lenses by nature have shorter um, uh, can have shorter uh, uh, focal minimum points. focal distances. Yeah. Exactly. So you don't need to be as far away from something to get it in focus. So this is a, it's a nice byproduct, whatever. Uh, the standard camera looks good. Like if you show me a photo from the iPhone 12 and the iPhone 13 in best optimal conditions, I couldn't tell the difference. I've looked at my iPhone 12 photos. In fact, one of the things that's new in iOS 15 that everyone has is you can take a picture and you can scroll up from the bottom, right? And you can see the metadata in that picture, which I like. So if you scroll up, you see the metadata about like the focal length, uh, your ISO, your exposure, you know, your your shutter, and what camera it was taken on. Is that so new? Say iPhone 12. That's in iOS 15. Didn't yeah. know that. So so it's a it's a nice feature for if you uh, if you like your uh, if, if you're um, you can adjust the metadata too, like location and stuff like that. Uh, so I've been using that to to do A/B comparisons uh, between my photos. I think the computational photography thing, I, they undersold. And I think it was very easy to dismiss that as, a, as fake photography. And I think at this point, we should have been having, you know, how many years of portrait mode for photos now? Mm -hmm. Remember when portrait mode came out? We all, we all shit on it, right? We all, like, we're, we're kind of snob, snobby about fake bokeh and all the places that didn't work great with glasses or hair. Um, and well, now, yes, but I also remember thinking this is the future. Like I, I remember thinking if this is possible now, imagine what's going to, what, where it's going to evolve to eventually like SLRs are expensive and they're, you know, they're bulky. And if we can, if we can get anywhere close to that, that's amazing. That's going to be great. And I would pr then prefer to use an iPhone for all photography than you carry on my SLR. And I have both, right? I have both. And in, in the case where I care about the photo, meaning like I'm going to print it out or it's going to be a wallpaper or something, like I might use the SLR if I have both. But I use portrait mode a lot for my photos. Like yeah. I use that if, if I don't need to raw edit and, and, and do, you know, uh, Lightroom effects on it or change the color temperature. If I'm taking these photos of the kids or the dog, yeah, it's a portrait mode photo. Because and it's gotten it's better. Gone to a point. It's it's so good now. It, it looks really good, and the effects that you can put on it to brighten up the face or add contouring, uh, the black and white modes, and that like the the the, the isolated don't get it. Like press, that those are still garbage, I think. But the standard portrait mode, yeah, like the studio lighting mode, I think looks great. Cinematic mode is the equivalent of that for video, and there are plenty of caveats. It being the first year, locked at 1080, 
30 FPS. I don't know why they can't do 24 FPS. Right. Because technically, you get more light you know, with a slower shutter, 24 yeah. FPS, 50, 150 of the second shutter. Uh, I understand why maybe not 4K because it's creating a depth map and blur mask per frame. Yeah, that's and, nuts. I mean, the fact that it's doing it at video at all, even right. if it were 24, would be amazing. Yeah. Like the fact yeah. that they can do this every frame for 24 frame or 30 frames a second, I think is alone is an achievement. And there's going to be a, a category of user that just uses it and uses the autofocusing face recognition part of it. And that's all they do. They do cinematic mode. They'll let it switch between, they'll maybe tap between faces, mm. but they'll never go and edit the video. Right. right. And I think even if you're just going to use that as a purely just, I want a, a nice looking video that's pleasurable to my eyes that gives some foreground blurring background yeah. blurring i've actually really really enjoyed that well here's video the, of the kids the yeah. thing the thing that they didn't describe in any detail on stage was the editing process of that because i understand that and i haven't talked to you about this yet but my understanding from the presentation was that you would be able to change the focal point in yep. post yep yes and so you can you not not uh, so I, I, like that's a feature that I think the reason they didn't talk about that is maybe a vast majority of people buying the iPhone, if they like shooting in cinematic mode, like people like shooting in portrait mode, are just going to shoot and use like you said the cinematic mode out of the camera, right. save that photo video. The one caveat is that because there's extra metadata that they're processing in real time, in order to export that video, they'll actually need to process and encode a video anytime you want to iMessage, upload to Dropbox, right. share on YouTube. So there's an extra layer of time. You know, this is this is where the processors, you know, do need a little bit more headroom, uh, where they can put more headroom in, in, in encoding. So you're not instantly sharing a video on, on Twitter. It has to has to encode that. When you click the edit button though, it gets pretty powerful. So like in portrait mode with the pro phones last year, you can click the aperture and you can change the level of depth in general, how how much it blurs the uh, the foreground and the background, the illusion of depth. So that's there. It's I think it defaults to f2.8, which is a pretty pretty wide aperture, but you can go to f2 and you can flatten it out to you know f10 or something. When I flatten out to f10, it's really curious because that shows me what the the raw video, the phone. Is capturing when I turn off the cinematic mode, and I think ideally that raw video is completely flat. It would need to be. It would right? need to be. Right? Otherwise, like Apple can't unblur it, right? Right. It's not completely flat huh. because if it was completely flat, the phone would be getting that. It would be receiving much less light, or would be more grainy, right? Because these are still small sensors, and I'm if I have a foreground effect here, it, there's going to be some natural blurring. So the the video camera is actually combining some of that natural blurring when it shifts in autofocus with then additional layer of blurring using the computational photography, which means that when you switch, when you want to manually, which you can, you can actually, there's a timeline and you can actually add keyframes. You can say, ooh, at this frame, it recognizes there's a face here and a face here. I want to focus on that face. You can switch it. In post, you can say, I want to focus on something that it wasn't baked into in the video, yeah. but it's not going to perfectly do it because there's going to be some natural, inherent optical blurring. Right. Already. So so if you had tapped that face live, mm -hmm. would it would it be sharper? Is it best to do it live when you're shooting? Like Absolutely. Best to do it live because okay. then it's shifting the optics exactly. as well as applying the depth map. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And the keyframes, like you can, you know, you can shift it up every, every second, right? You can say forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. You can yeah. have some crazy, crazy blurring effect, whatever, whether in real time or, uh, or, or in post, uh, the thing you can't change is how fast it shifts from the background to the foreground. Hmm. So if you're holding, you know, a, a, a camera, you know, typically, you know, I'll shift this. You can rotate that lens right you can shift the face i'm on autofocus right now but you can shift rack focusing means you yeah. can you can actually adjust the focus and in professional video you know there are focus pullers that use rigs that you know 
according to what the cinematographer and director wants, can shift that focus. That's part of the storytelling of video, of shifting from forward to background. Here, it's one speed. They ramp up at their fixed speed. I think they choose that speed because that shift in focus is where the computational photography is most likely to fail. Like hmm. It's easy for them to go from one plane of focus to another plane of focus, show those two, but in the transition, that's where you see you know, the feathering effects, and that's right. where you see some of the, the, the masking not perfectly uh, wrapped around the subjects. Well, this sounds super cool. I, we have so much more to discuss in this episode, so I, don't, I suppose we can't go too <laughs> deeper on this one, but I want to see an example of your videos. Have you shared anything on Twitter or anywhere? I, I did on the very first day. I did some with the dog and uh, and the kid, uh, and it's very uh, the autofocus is very jumpy, so it'll, it'll try to jump, you know, it, um, it'll try to lock onto what it thinks you want to lock onto, which is typically whatever's in the foreground. Yeah, uh, you can double tap a subject and say lock onto this subject, um, and it does a pretty good job identifying using bounding boxes anything that it thinks could be a subject. So whether it's an animal, oh, whether it's a, a not face, just people. Not okay. just people, even like in uh, you know, just fixed objects. So the the neural net, the the machine learning they've done to train video uh, has 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 been pretty good for that. Uh, pro tip for people using cinematic mode: uh, try to incorporate some stuff in the foreground, like something that really helps. It's not just about you know a face of your subject and then the background being blurred, but if you move your camera and you have an additional element, you know whether it's a, a microphone here or some flowers in the foreground. That gets nicely blurred as well, and it creates a better uh, effect, a uh, uh, cinematic effect, I think. So, so try that. And I'll share some, some, some more stuff on, on Twitter, some, some videos. I will say the last 30 or so videos I've shot on my phone, in addition to maybe a handful of those trying to, trying to test and brute force test this mode, but most of those just family videos and stuff around the house and stuff around the world, yeah. all cinematic mode. I could imagine anything you're shooting in the, in the you know, near field why not? Like it would just look better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I, I, it's if you're shooting, and this goes back to photography as well. If you're capturing imagery where the goal of the image is to eventually watch it and share it on this size device, a phone or a tablet or a laptop, and not a big screen, you're not pixel peeping on your you know big monitor or your your 4K TV. They, they control end to end, right? They control the pipeline from lens to screen, it's going to look best on the screen because of that. Right. And so, yeah, it's, I, I think it's powerful. And I think there are plenty of places where they know they can improve, but for something out of the gate, it does like, you know, with Apple stuff, just work. Uh, moving on. Uh, the other big tech story is the big Amazon event. They, now they dropped a ton of Echo products from, uh, you see like they have a, a wall mounted, uh, big uh, display, 15 inch wall mounted digital picture frame that has uh, the, the smart assistant built in. There's this one thing called the Amazon Glow that it's a kid friendly device. It has a projector that projects an interactive touchscreen. A surface on like puzzles and stuff onto a table, as well as having a display for video conferencing. So I guess it's made for like maybe remote learning or some type of educational experiences, puzzles, art, uh, but it's using projector technology, short throw projector on a table combined with a screen. That looked interesting. There have been products like this before that that do the projection of like a tangram puzzle or something that the, that a child can then interact with. But I don't think they've done it with that, you know, FaceTime. With the screen, that's the innovation. Combination. And so yeah. like that, I think that the idea is the person on that video call can interact with the same game using it, using their own screen. Right. Right, um, so on the on yeah. the receiving end, whatever app they're using, yeah. because of the camera angle, they can see what's being projected. There's going to be a sweet spot, right? Because you put this device on a tabletop surface, high contrast or whatever. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, it's 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 not too far away from just every both people having an iPad, you know, and like you know doing like some sort of online game or video call. But it, I think, there's something about the tactile nature of touching, you know, puzzle pieces that is important for children especially young, young children. And so, yeah, I, I can see that. Um, it's interesting. I, I mean, my kids are too old for that now, but I'll be curious if anybody with younger kids uh, picks one of these up and what they think of it. I feel like I'm in the market for this because yeah. 
I'll tell you, kids love puzzles and puzzles take up space. And if this get and they love the iPad also, yep. <laughs> and if this gives them a tactile touch digital experience with animations and the puzzle experience, but it's not YouTube on the iPad, and it's basically a fun app that's bigger, you know, a bigger screen than the iPad, um, and with a video call for the grandparents. Yeah, totally. Like that could be very appealing. Yep. Uh, there's a thermostat, so they're trying to get into the the same marketplace as Nest. Uh, it's a seventy dollar thermostat, so reasonably priced. Um, does this have uh, the assistant built in? Uh, it does I have. Does it have like an have it built the assistant? Yeah, it's. I, it's, I don't want to it, say the name. It's sixty dollars, not seventy dollars. Okay. And it's. I I think this is great because like my mom, you know, would love a smart thermostat, but she doesn't want all the complexity of a Nest, you know. And yeah. and honestly, like we have one. I can't. For it just always wants to do its own thing. It thinks it can schedule your your thermostat settings for you, and it like it keeps going back to this automatic setting. I just want old school i just want to be able to say what temperature i wanted to be and turn it off when i wanted to be and this kind of feels like that vibe and i think that's what my mom would like anyway my my only hope is that this really is compatible with most um furnaces and and you know home uh, hvacs because nest is not necessarily that it's it's you need sometimes more wires than you know legacy uh, older houses have yeah, they say that you can even get rebates from your your yeah. gas provider for efficiencies, and that could Makes take sense. the cost down to you know ten bucks from sixty. But then you might need an adapter kit, like a fifteen dollar right. adapter kit for the the carbon wire um, to actually get it to tap into you know your your furnace. Uh, but sixty bucks way more compelling than what one hundred thirty bucks or whatever it is for the Nest right now, or that complexity. Yep. As fancy as the Nest looks uh and then two kind of uh let's say a little more controversial things one <laughs> previously announced the surveillance drone in your house that you can now sign up for for a beta who thinks this is a good idea i my favorite thing about that original video was that they they made it look like this pleasant experience when you you know in reality you're gonna hear <laughs> you know this thing buzzing around your house and if you have any pets at all it's gonna be absolute torture so yeah that, that that's a funny device yeah, $250 uh, starting now this week. You can sign up for the, uh, what is it called? The Ring Always Home Cam. Ready to take off. If you <laughs> hadn't seen it before, it's it, it looks like a Sono speaker base station kind of thing. Round corner, sits near the table, but it actually has a multi-rotor, a quadcopter drone with a camera built in. And when you're not in the house, it flies off of the charging dock and goes to set specific viewpoints on demand to, to watch what's going on in your house and just don't have open windows you don't want a little draft in there or pets i guess yep uh, i i don't want one but i want to visit the home of someone who has one to see it work i guess so <laughs> yeah. i can't imagine yeah yeah and i the other thing that i i don't know if anyone out there is interested in but certainly amazon's very proud of is their new robot, not the Jibo, it's the Astro. I thought it, it's interesting they're not calling this, you know, an, an Echo, um, that they gave this a new name. I think this is indicative of a new thing. Like, and this is, the, and they've even said in like the biggest, like, uh, you know, the, the prime video that they released about this product, they say this isn't our last robot. This is our first <laughs> robot. So I think that, yeah. they, that they are saying like, don't judge us on this robot. So I, I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Like I would, because I do like Echo. I could see them evolving to, you know, having something actually that I would want to buy. This is not it. <laughs> if they were smarter, it'd be don't not don't judge us on this robot. Don't judge the robot. Right. Anthropomorphize it more. Give it sad wally puppy eyes. <laughs> well, how, don't judge the robot. He's just getting started. Exactly. It's just exactly. getting started. Yeah. Uh, but do you want to, idea, do you want yeah, to describe yeah. it? It's it's a it's a one thousand dollar robot, by the way. Yeah. So it's small. So it sits on the ground, two wheels, and it looks like it has like a tablet slapped to the you know just anchor to the the front of it uh that does it swivel is that right that that tablet uh, or is it fix fix screen uh, you can tell it, if it i think articulates it, it looks to me like it can turn a little bit so it yeah. can almost like look in a direction yeah but it has you know has cameras has sensing 
Uh, it doesn't do vacuuming, but in the back <laughs> of it, it can carry your your beverages. Oh my god! Yeah, there, God, there was a toy. Like, I guess that was like the big like it was in every commercial for toy robots back in the eighties. Was like it was it would carry a, a beer to dad. You know, and, and that that's exactly <laughs> what happens in this video, except it carries it to the spouse. It carries it to the, to the wife who's not on board with the robot until she gets her beer delivery. And then she's like, yeah. okay, I'm on board. Yeah. I don't so know. there are two axes of articulation. The screen pivots up and down, and it goes left and right. So that's a little of animation. Just There's a, little a telescoping bit. camera that's, that goes up. Like, that's interesting. That was the most interesting part, I thought, because it is a very low-profile robot, so you wonder about its utility. So, like, the main utility of this thing is to exist on a single floor of your house and be able to rise up to about three or three feet high and in, and see things. So if you – I don't know what that is. Like, they said – Thermos, you, like an oven. That's, what, that's their example. Did I leave the oven on? You can drive your robot to the oven – and raise the camera up, the periscope, and see that it's off. And there you go. Maybe you can check on your pet, or you can see if there's food in the food bowl. You can probably inspect the house for intruders. Actually, it will monitor your house for intruders. It has a, a, a sentry mode. So <laughs> <laughs> this this robot isn't going to rise up anytime soon, right? This robot can't do stairs. It will, it will throw itself downstairs, from what some of the the beta testers and developers have said, based on its its tracking. It's yeah. uh, it's it's unintimidating to say the least. I like that also in their promo video. There are multiple shots of it navigating a house with pets that are ignoring it. So like a sleeping, sleeping. dog or a dog's <laughs> walking past it because it's not going to aggravate those pets. Yeah. In their mind, sure. Uh, you mentioned surveillance mode. It makes me think about their their little drone thing. If they were smart, they'd want those to interact in some way. Give them both personalities. Then you then you got your Toy Story. When you leave the house, your Amazon robots are <laughs> are having adventures and talking to each other and, and yeah. synchronizing in some way. Uh, and and of course, it's low profile, so it can interact with kids. You know, it can do all the things that kids love from these smart assistants, from games and and wikipedia queries and you know helping them with their math homework right yeah the and addition however problems. the examples they showed in the video were the teenage girl asking the robot to dance with it or, <laughs> and then the ceo of amazon says beatbox and, and the robot like does the song like i don't this is not the killer app people <laughs> we this is not what's going to sell the robot to people we need actual utility you know and we need hands we need the robot to be able to actually reach out and interact with the world, not just perceive it. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm not saying that Tesla, the, the Tesla promise is what I'm on board with, because I think that is like the, at least Amazon is being, if, you know, honest about what's possible right now. But um, I, you know, this just, I don't even know why this is a product other other than maybe they need to, they want to get some units out there to evolve their Slam. There's simultaneous loca uh, locomotion and, and mapping, so that they can scan the world and learn how to interpret it better. And they need to get into more homes in order to do that. That's the only reason I could imagine they need this out there. This is this does not seem like a practical product. This may be a toy for the for the rich, but this is this is a weird one. Toy for the rich is right. Uh, you think about when they launched the original Echo devices, and everyone's very wary about uh, microphone arrays in their house, and as they should be, and as they still are. But the immediate utility of it being a, a good Bluetooth speaker and responsive as an assistant in a way, it had killer app features that offered enough convenience that people were willing to overlook and still to this day overlook some of the, the concerns uh, of that type of device. This device, this $1,000 robot doesn't have any of those killer apps to make me any less concerned about a roaming camera on wheels in my home. Yeah. Thousand bucks. Robots, they, they believe it's the future. Um, all right. Before we wrap up, uh, we do have some VR to talk about, maybe a VR three minutes. Uh, first of all, Lone Echo 2 has a final release date, October Again. 12th. Yeah, that's just around the corner. 
Yeah, yeah. So ahead of Facebook Connect, which is October 28th, we've got a bunch of this VR stuff coming out of their game studios. Lonek, of course, they acquired uh, Ready at Dawn. So this has been delayed. This is desktop VR. So you use over Link, Air Link, or the now not sold, uh, the Rift S. Uh, but, you know, if anyone... Uh, was hoping for Lone Echo 2 maybe native on Quest. The one thing that I was announced this week that may give you hope for that is that Medal of Honor is now getting ported over for native Quest 2. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe I'll finally finish it. I don't know. I just hope they got the load times down because that that those are long. And uh, there's also, obviously, there's a lot of long cutscenes in that in that game. I don't know. I, I it's great. I mean, it, I'm glad that they're bringing over a a you know a high quality in terms of like the graphics and you know big budget game to the quest. It, that makes perfect sense. Uh, it, it's a, probably a technical challenge to have done that, and I commend them. Um, I just the game the, the original game kind of was a was a bit of a letdown for me, and I I look forward to seeing how it performs on Quest. I, I do think it's going to be a big game. Uh, they did get the size down quite a bit, I understand, but it's if you have a 64 gigabyte Quest, it's, there's not going to be room for much else on that Quest. No, they said they're aiming for 40 to 45 gigabytes, and already on a 64 gig Quest, you have OS that takes up, you know, almost, what is it, a, a 5 to 10 gigabytes of space. So people are frustrated that if they did just buy a 64 gigabyte quest which we thought was going to be suitable for most people because games were only one or two gigs each this is going to be 40 to 45 gigs you have to download maybe download a smaller version and it unpacks up to 40 45 gigs uh people are wondering maybe like if they just want to play multiplayer right like i think one of the reasons this exists this game is getting ported over is because they spent so much money investing in a triple a yeah. medal of honor game um that eventually you know kind of fizzled out and most of their users are now on mobile on quest uh they want to get this they want to make the most out of that investment and it wasn't cheap i'm sure to do the port but maybe have a version that's just the multiplayer so you don't need all the assets for single player right a multiplayer right. skew version would be great there's the uh, documentary stuff too yeah, and, and you want that to hopefully be optional, so right. you know you can just watch that and then not have to have that store on uh, on your your drive. I mean, I know the the base uh, capacity now is one twenty eight gigs, but there are so many users out there with just that sixty four gig SKU. Um, also, Rec Room Rally launched this week. You had a chance to play some of it. Yeah, I'm supporting my jersey. Uh, I, I jumped in there for the first time in a while, man. A rec room has evolved. They're, like the watch met interface, so much of it. There's, you know, I, they don't make you go through it if you're already an existing account, but they have a really great introductory thing now where if you're a new user, you, you're at the front of the, of the rec room of like, you know, the schoolhouse, you're outside and they, they invite you to come in and you walk inside and they have these trophy cases of like, all the years that Rec Room has been around and they have elements from all of the mini games that they made in those time periods. So like you have, you know, the Isle of Lost Skulls and, you know, all of the adventures and quests that we did and uh, Rec Royale and they have like, it's pretty, pretty great. And they like show you how things work. Like I, they're doing a lot to like figure out how to make it a, a good environment and a welcoming environment. Unfortunately, <laughs> I jumped in the Rec room rally and within five seconds there was a child <sighs> encouraging me and everyone else on the server to like have sexual relations with him <laughs> in his own words uh you know harder than we currently were he <laughs> was was a he was he was requesting and it was it was just like come on man can i just go into a community and just ha have people just be normal just be calm and like adults, please. But then I found the setting was like only hear your friends, which if mm. anybody does any rec room or probably any social gaming, that should be the default setting. Like honestly, like you should be able, they should be an opt in to hear the public because if, if there's no way having had that experience, I should be, let one of my kids, like my young kids jump into rec room. Obviously they're supposed to have, all kids are supposed to have an account that's, uh, age gated and if you are in a child account you're not supposed to have those you know settings you're not supposed to have those abilities to hear and to speak but i don't know these kids are getting around it i one interesting way to 
that they one thing they do now is they have you stretch your arms out. I was seat I was seated and I stretched my arms out and they uh, they said you look to be about five eight in height, which is exactly what I am. And I would, so that's that's impressive. And so that that is an interesting way that they're sort of m- making sure that you are you know of a certain height, I guess. But that doesn't prove anything about age. I don't yeah. know if that's uh, if they're using that or not. Anyway, uh, the the rec room rally game was uh, it was it was cool. Like people have been asking for a rally for a driving cart go kart game in rec room for a long time for years, and they really they delivered. It's a, it's an it's an interesting game. Um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, motion intense, but not not in a way that I found discomfort. But I th- could imagine some people might. Uh, but it's it's cool. It, during the pregame, you can all sit in the same car and drive around together. I think what I'm most interested to see is how this cart is used by players in their own spaces, because of course that is where Rec Room has evolved. Like we haven't seen a whole lot of original content from Rec Room because they've been spending all their time developing the maker tools so that their user base can make their own spaces. And so I look forward to seeing what they do with this cart. You know, I could imagine you could turn it into a vehicle, any vehicle, you know, a spaceship. You could turn it into like a, a snowmobile or anything you want. And uh, that's that's super cool. I, I do look forward to seeing how that, what that evolves into. Yeah, I do miss the the, the polish in-house developed quests and and you know the actual the, the the making of a new skin game and I know, you know they're competing with VR Chat and there's so much user generated content that's really amazing from those from both those platforms and they have had record numbers of users and record numbers of rooms created and people hanging out uh, that they feel like that's where they feel like that's that's one of their strengths. Um, but to go back to your experience <laughs> with the, with the youngins there, I think that's one of the reasons that Horizons hasn't launched is that. They can't afford to launch, Facebook can't afford to launch Horizons and have the default be no communication because social communication is such a big part of the selling point of this, you know, this version of the metaverse Um, and community, a welcoming community and a safe community is one of the toughest problems to solve. Like they haven't solved it on the standard, like flat Facebook feed. So how are they going to do it in a way for a a smaller user base, but with more powerful interactive tools like gestures and voice and motion controls? It's really hard given the limited, you know, and I say limited, you know, with understanding that it's, uh, it's relative, but a limited number of VR headsets out there. Like we are still early days and it's uh you know it's not the kind of thing where like you said facebook can afford to have a you know an opt-in option because if you do that you're not going to have any friends who are online at the moment in yeah. m- more than likely when you jump in there so yeah it's a re- it's a tough problem it's and i do commend i i some of my best experiences have been in rec room in in vr some of my best vr experiences have been in that game playing with you and kishore specifically and you know, some other friends playing through the quests. And like, I do see them adding features to try to figure this problem out. And I commend them for that effort. And I just look forward to that problem being solved. And they're kind of doing it under the radar right now. It's not a, it's, it's a thing that kids and again, with their millions of users, it's still not a mainstream mainstream isn't still as aware of it. And so I think they can, they have a little bit more runway to try to solve those problems versus with a thing like horizons, anything that Facebook does is going to get scrutiny. And so they can't afford to launch without it being perfect or near perfect. Um, Well, Facebook horizons is, is only going to be on quest. Like Rec Room is on so many devices. It's on flat screens. It's on PC. It's on phones, iPads, VR, PlayStation VR. You know, it's on. It's everywhere. Uh, so it's it a is giant. A, yeah. It's much bigger user base than Horizons will be at launch. Uh, yeah. And even then, you still. I don't think that they have the quantity necessary of users in order. You know, to to be able to. You know, uh, to do to do it right. Uh, that does it for the episode this week. Hopefully, we'll be back next week with Kishore and a full cast to talk about maybe uh, the latest What If episode, as well as other things coming out in the world. Um, October is going to be a busy month. I can't believe we're in October already. Uh, we'll be at New York Comic Con next week. Uh, I'll still be able to do a podcast. I'm not flying out until 
late later that week. But uh, we have a lot of great stuff on the site for you to check out. Some uh, more projects. Uh, Adam went to visit um, Grant Amahara's workshop and chat with um, Fawn Davis about some of the stuff that uh, he was working on and show off some of those that that space. Um, so please watch that. Uh, and uh, yeah, just more more cool stuff coming soon. I can't believe. It's October already. Um, Je- uh, Jeremy, good to see you this week. You Thanks too, for jumping in. Uh, we'll play a quick outro so I can have it embedded in the file here. This one, I think, comes from Great Job. Here we go. Hi there. I didn't see you. Test it. Twitter hasn't really commented on this, so we don't know if this crackdown is about those inflated numbers because, like, you can inflate your numbers a million ways. There's whole server farms where you can pay 10 bucks for, you know, a thousand followers or whatever. That explains your numbers. Oh, whoa, whoa, Just, whoa. That's a deep cut. That was a little mean. bit of Kishore on the podcast. <laughs> who, who is that mean guy? Mean. <laughs> all right. See you all next week. Bye.